Today's podcast episode features a chat with an old friend of mine named Anton Heskia. He's another accent coach that I've known for a few years, actually. He's a specialist in British English, what we also call RP, or Received Pronunciation, for diplomats, business people, interpreters, researchers, and even scientists. And in this episode, we're going to talk about what it's like to be an accent coach. You've got two accent coaches here from different accent backgrounds giving you what it's like to be us. We're really talking about why it's important to be your own kind of teacher, how we both got into teaching accents and what our journey has been like, and also how that influences our teaching methodologies and philosophies. It's not just a story about accent coaching, but it's really about collaboration and discrimination and authenticity and perceptions of our accents and even our jobs, and also how social media is even changing the way we work. So I hope you find this episode as interesting as I did to listen to Anton's stories and learn more about what I actually do. Now, on with the show. I'm Bianca, your personal American accent coach, and I'm here to help you master an American accent in English because your voice is your choice when it comes to how you sound. I try to release a podcast episode every two weeks, and so you should really subscribe to whatever podcast platform you use so that you don't miss the newest episode. And by the way, if you want to see the full video of the episode, it's available at Accent Coach Bianca on YouTube. Now, let's get on with the show. Hey, Anton, how have you been? I haven't seen you in such a long time. <laughs> Hi, Bianca. It's great to see you. It's been a while, hasn't it? Well, it's funny you say it's great to see you, but I don't think I've ever seen you in person because we met back in the clubhouse days, right? Right. Where it was audio only. I think it's the first time I've ever seen your face, actually. No, I, I did drop into a Discord a few times. Oh, re oh, yes, a long time ago. And your camera yeah. was on at that point, yeah? Yeah, I did have my camera on. Okay, maybe so I just didn't remember. Did yeah, it was a while ago, but yeah. Long that, so time we did ago, actually. Kind of virtual meetings using the webcam. Uh, yeah, and I'm so I still use Discord for my platform, my main community platform, but I haven't been on on Clubhouse in in a very long time. Have you been active in Clubhouse? Yeah, I haven't been using it for a while. A lot of people, it just died out, unfortunately. Yeah. And I don't know, they were they spent a lot of time reprogramming the whole interface, oh. and they made so many changes. <laughs> I couldn't figure out how, I couldn't figure out how to use it anymore. I think I don't know. I, I don't know if I think officially they've stopped it, but it still seems to be operating. I don't really know. Oh. But it's a shame. I remember a couple of years ago, it was pretty big, it was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. And I got to meet a lot of interesting people. Yeah, I had the same experience and I, I felt like there were things changing really quickly. It had a very specific group of people that it was after. I love the idea of audio only. And I feel like they got that idea originally from Discord and people originally who were gamers. Now it kind of Discord is for everybody. But I remember thinking, oh, that's genius, right? Audio only. So many people need it. But then it did change so quickly. And I just, I was having a lot of technical trouble maybe because of that. And yeah, after a while, I just couldn't, I just couldn't get on the platform anymore, which is a shame. I think they had problems with monetization. Mm -hmm. I think the people who created the platform, they needed to find a way to monetize it. And then you had people who were joining the platform who wanted to also use it as a means to promote their businesses, their services or whatever they were doing. And I spoke to a lot of people and a lot of people got very frustrated because, okay, during the peak of the pandemic, people didn't really have a lot to do. Well, some people did, yeah. but a lot of people, they were stuck at home. And it gave people an opportunity to meet new people, discuss their ideas. It gave people the opportunity to promote their ideas. But the problem is a, a lot of people got very frustrated because they felt that it wasn't leading to any, you know, monetary gain. Like mm -hmm. there was no financial incentive. Mm -hmm. So I did get a few students from Clubhouse, but a lot of people were doing free lessons, free workshops online. And it got to a point, how long can I keep on doing this? I myself... I'm back in the real world and I did enjoy doing well, and Zoom or whatever. And I did enjoy doing the, the online classes with Clubhouse, but it was a lot of effort and only a very small fraction of people would be converted to becoming mm -hmm. students or actual paying customers. And at the end of the day, if you're doing this to earn money, there comes a point where paying customers have to be given priority as much fun as clubhouse is and then if you don't put enough effort into clubhouse then you lose your following too mm -hmm. so a lot of people are using clubhouse for language learning but now i think it's moving more towards 
learners interacting with each other rather than mm. teachers interacting with learners because mm. it's great to provide a service yeah. but at the end of the day you know we can't keep doing that once in a while exactly exactly yeah, yeah. So i think the the people who created the platform they didn't really have a solution on how to create a platform where people could make money through it mm -hmm. if all these things like you know facebook for example whatever these servers they might appear free on the surface but there's a lot of advertising mm. people selling services that's just the way things work yeah a lot goes into that behind the scenes totally yeah, yeah. i couldn't i think there's a place and a need i don't know if you experience this but i there we do a lot for free already right there's a lot that we put out there a lot right. of education already and it was just one more thing that yeah which is great because a lot of people need access to those things. But yeah, I was on the same page where, okay, I have to make some choices here. I need to see where to put my energy and all, and just decide what to say no to in the end. But I did enjoy meeting other teachers. Mm. That was fun. But then sometimes people became quite competitive. People could become quite protective of their ideas. Mm -hmm. So I met a lot of, it was interesting because you don't really have the opportunity to accent reduction voice coaching, English teaching, pronunciation. There's a kind of, they all cross over at some point. And it's really interesting to meet people around the world who work in some form or another in this area, mm -hmm. right? Because you can exchange ideas and you don't really, here in London, who can I meet who does what I do? I don't really meet a lot of people who do this. I don't really get to have these discussions. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem is people are afraid to like share ideas. They're afraid someone's going to steal their idea. They're afraid that someone's going to take their idea and make it better. And that's a problem. And I've tried to collaborate with other teachers. I want to, I'm trying to create a franchise program from what, I've, for what I'm doing. Mm. But I think this is the problem. A lot of people, there's this lack of trust. Yes. Is your idea better than mine? Uh -huh. Am I doing this? Am I just working for you or are you working for me? Or are we working together? Mm. You know what I'm saying? And when you're not doing something for profit, you don't have this problem, mm -hmm. right? Because it's just for fun. But when you're doing something because you want to expand it, scale it, then so that's unfortunate. Mm. And a lot of the time you just want to talk about this stuff. You just want to talk about pronunciation people you just who want are to like you and yeah like to nerd out about these things i i had the same experience and i would have people flat out tell me oh no i'm not going to say anything i'm not going to give anything away and they're in our field they're like lone wolves doing doing their own thing and i think that comes out of a fear like you said of not i don't know maybe not getting their kind of slice of the pie as it were but i've come to think that the pie is just getting bigger and bigger and it's a huge industry and it's the pie is getting bigger and the slices are getting bigger and there's no reason not to collaborate with people so I feel like this has been one of my drives and one of the reasons originally I contacted you was like oh this guy's gonna have a great perspective we're gonna have a lot of fun talking about these things and I, I'm always trying to reach out to other people in our field because I, there's a lot of competitiveness but I think there's people who are very competitive and then there's People like us who are like, oh, no, we're all in this together. You know, we can all learn from each other. And that's why I was really excited so long ago to meet you and now to get you back here again. But the thing is, I think every teacher is very different in their teaching style, too, and what they believe in. So even if I was to give all, all my information away to someone, like I was discussing this with my student, you know, my online courses are really long. There's a lot of content. If another teacher came along and they wanted to model their teaching method and what I do, they'd have to, they'd have to spend a long time reworking everything they'd really have to examine it mm -hmm. and really try and figure out it's not just figuring it out but it's also implementing it like mm -hmm. the amount of time and effort i put into it if i was trying if i was to like relearn this teaching method again that would take a very long time i don't i really i th maybe i think there's a certain amount of paranoia mm -hmm. as well i i don't know but yeah, it's nice to share ideas and, and, and collaborate. I don't know, do people in other industries like that? Are people in right. in, in other teaching <laughs> professions? Like, I, I don't what know. What kind of teacher? It's very niche, right? What we do is very specialized. I don't know how to compare it to other things that you're teaching out there. I have a friend who works in quality assurance, and she teaches other people how to 
become quality assurance people. So I think that's the closest thing I can think of is teaching people how to do those other things. But yeah, there's not a lot of people like us. And I think we can, the more we can work together, the better it is for everybody. Because like you said, it's not like, oh, I'm going to give away this one secret and all is lost. But it's also the personality of the person. So we, no, exactly. we tend to connect yeah. with, with certain people and, and not with others. So I think even if somebody, you know, had a hold of all your secrets, they still wouldn't be you. And they still wouldn't connect with a lot of people. I mean, they can get all my secrets. I mean, they can buy my course. Exactly. Someone really wants all my secrets. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the amount of time and effort that it would take, they might as well just do their own thing. Right. You know what I'm saying? What's the point? It's uh -huh. just going to be easier to just be yourself. I had this experience when I was living in Japan teaching English. This was like going back to 2009. I remember being a British person in Japan, like you felt you there was this this pressure to be more extrovert, mm. more American, because mm. Americans, there's this stereotype of Americans being extrovert, talking loudly, and that's what <laughs> Japanese people want, because Japanese people are so introvert. And if you want to work oh. at an English language school in Japan, mm -hmm. why do you want to work in an English language school in Japan? Well, you want a visa so you can stay in Japan, and you want an easy job and do other things on the side. Mm -hmm. And everyone has this thing like, I have to be like an, an, an extrovert American to get a job at a at an English school in Japan but after a few years I realized that actually that just wasn't going to work mm. and a lot of people were number a a lot of people wanted to learn British English because British English had become more popular especially with TV programming such as Sherlock Holmes films such as Harry Potter and they wanted a teacher with a more reserved mannerism Mm -hmm. So they weren't looking for an American. So they wanted me. That's the thing. You have to find your own niche in the market mm -hmm. for whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you try and be, if you try and do what everyone else is doing, it's not going to work out. And it's like my online courses, like I told you, I don't advertise on any of these teacher student matching services because I had this experience when I was living in Japan. And when I came back to the UK, I just didn't feel I would get I didn't know, I didn't feel confident that I'd be able to market myself. Mm. I didn't feel confident I'd get, be able to get students. When you live in an East Asian countries, it, when you live in an East Asian country, such as Japan, Korea, perhaps China, when you live in these countries, it's very easy to get a job teaching English because you're a Westerner and you look foreign, you look exotic, you look like you speak fluent English and you've already passed the, you're from an English speaking country, you're a native, you're already, you've already, you're already qualified, right? You checked all the but boxes. In, right, you tick all the boxes. But when you live a, in an English speaking country, it's like, that's not really going to get me very far. And that, you know, that's why a lot of people spend so much time out there because country. So I was always into like translation, mm -hmm. right? That was my interest. But when I, and I did do a lot of translation, I did a lot of online medical translation, very interesting, but with People talk about AI now, it's such a huge buzzword, but uh -huh. even six, seven years ago, AI was taking over translation. Like I was getting a lot more requests to do machine trans, to do machine assisted, like to check machine assisted mm -hmm. AI translation, right? The so precursor. it's getting less and less, it was getting less well paid, even though I was doing really interesting translation, like medical rate translation, but my brain like felt like it was just going to explode at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, reading through all these things and having to go through thousands of words without the pay ever increasing because there are more and more people getting into it. Mm. So there was a lot of, there were a lot of people asked who asked me to do pronunciation. Mm. Uh, initially it was for Japanese people. And I had a lot of experience doing this when I was living in Japan, I lived at a pronunciation school, but I never really, it wasn't bad, but I did other things. So I never put like my full effort into it. And then Initially, I was just doing it for Japanese people, just mm -hmm. for Japanese people. And then I decided, look, maybe I should actually start expanding it and adapt it to a more global audience, people from different countries. I've got to get different students from different backgrounds, I've got to learn more about the way they articulate sounds and the problems that they're having. But then again, I thought, okay, look, I could go onto one of these websites, create a profile, and now what? It's like me and like a thousand plus other teachers oh, who's can I stop you there because yeah. I, have, I have a question about the when you say platform so it sounds like you started this kind of as a side gig and then you found a platform that's what I was doing too I was doing it on the side and I found right. a couple of platforms I think I was on italki and there's also Cambly. Yeah. there's a couple of places so you mean more of a how should we call it a teacher marketplace basically so that's what one of my friends he was using mm -hmm. but I just couldn't 
bring myself to register on either uh, on italki mm. or the other one you mentioned there are a few of them and i had a few chinese companies contact me through linkedin as well mm -hmm. and the pay that they were offering was just how can i say it not worth my time <laughs> <laughs> yeah just not worth my time and i just didn't want to i had this experience in japan working for schools doing what i'm told and i'm i did that in japan because i needed a visa mm. right mm. that's why i did it back in the uk I don't have to, as long as I'm financially secure, I don't have to work for someone else. Yeah. I don't have to, I don't need a visa. I don't need an employer mm. just to stay in this country. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, and I knew like when I was in Japan, I remember I, when I was working at this pronunciation school, we would do, um, we would do like a trial lesson or an orientation for new students. And the student would decide if they want to learn American English pronunciation or British English pronunciation. Mm -hmm. So American English was always general American. Yep. My boss did ask me, so I'm deviating a bit here and there. I'm going to try yep. and get to the point. My boss did ask me if I would teach general American English. And looking back, I should have accepted it. <laughs> I should have accepted it. What makes you but say I that? did. And I regret it uh -huh. because it, it would have been fun doing it. And I think I could have done it. But they had the option between general American uh -huh. or British English pronunciation, or more specifically, received pronunciation. Oh, of course. And I remember, for me, it was like, my boss would say to the students, oh, Anton, he speaks received pronunciation. Can we, can we clarify for people who don't know the difference of what you're talking about? So there's <laughs> our, okay, I think a lot of accent, dialect people, no, let me start over. So from the outside, anything that's not American English or Australian English, and I'm, I'm generalizing here, but we really generalize and we say, oh, British, British English, right? And I get the sense that if you are from that area, that generalization is absolutely ridiculous because you have so many dialects, accents, right? And so even just starting from there, what does that mean to you, British accent? Is it ridiculous? And then number two, can you tell the listeners more about what RP means and why that was funny to you? for any in any country there's always the standard accent or the standard dialect like the one the accent that you hear in television and media right that's not putting down other accents mm. it, it's just like that anywhere right mm. so for america it's general american and it, it doesn't matter any society and your accent the manner you speak can reflect your up, upbringing and background in general, when you look at the media or you look at the international media, you look at Hollywood, you look at films with British actors, they will tend to speak with an RP accent. And that's why, and from an American perspective, when they think of a British accent, it's unreasonable for people, people say that a British accent, an American accent, it's unreasonable for people to to think of all the different accents and dialects we just we don't have time to do that our brains can't process mm -hmm. all these different things we just got to make it easy for ourselves mm -hmm. so for most people when they associate internationally not in the uk but i would say internationally people associate the british accent with received pronunciation like when americans say oh i love your accent because it's british usually it's because they like the british rp accent doesn't necessarily mean it's superior but it's just that's the kind of perception and that's because you see a lot of British actors in Hollywood films. Like when you see these British actors in Hollywood films, most of them speak with a British RP accent, receive pronunciation. Mm. Domestically within the UK, if you switch on the television, you'll see, you'll listen to a whole diverse range of accents and dialects because of the reasons of inclusion, because your accent can reflect your background and your upbringing. And it would be wrong to say to people, unless you speak receive pronunciation, you shouldn't appear on TV. And things have really changed over the last 50, 60 years. Before, mm -hmm. if, you wanted to make an, if you wanted to be on television or in the media, you had to speak RP. And even the RP accents yeah, yeah. have changed because it's seen as discriminatory in a sense. There's two sides of it. One is the ability to understand people better. Like certain accents are yeah. easy to understand for a global audience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's one reason why we would... I will get into the definition to R, of RP, or what it actually is, but... And so that's one reason to speak with an RP accent, because perhaps it's going to be easier for others to understand. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not so important in the UK. Maybe it is. I don't know. Yeah. I, mean, I can't say for sure, but it depends on your, you know, acts, you know, depending on the environment 
you know the way people speak can really vary mm. and that and you know it's like that in any country right so yeah going on to the next point what is received pronunciation some people call it let's talk about what people call it but what yeah. people have told me they think mm-hmm. bbc what they what people have told me that they think received pronunciation means <laughs> right so for a lot of people it means bbc english again mm. they're associating it with the media for some people it means the queen's english although she's not around anymore or the 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 english of the royal family for other people it means english spoken by people in the upper classes mm-hmm. right but then if you look at the history of received pronunciation it appears that and i'm not an expert on the history of this accent this is what i'm teaching but don't quote me as some kind of expert mm-hmm. on how this accent evolved because i'm not this is just mm-hmm. the accent that i'm teaching but it seems to me that what was i saying about the <laughs> about rp and the maybe the history of it also the fact that even though it seems to be the face of kind of british oh right so that it it was it was created as like a standardized dialect Mm. to avoid what they wanted to do is they thought if we can have an accent that can make people more equal so that people cannot tell where you're from this is the problem with Mm. regional accents it's like you can it's easy to discriminate against people Mm. or to distinguish between people based on the way they speak it happens in any culture in any society right whether it's right whether it's wrong it's just humans have this nature of when they hear different sounds or that sometimes it can be positive sometimes it can be negative Mm. um it's great to have a a diverse range of of accents Mm -hmm. okay it's a Mm -hmm. good thing but apparently or from what i understand the rp accent the whole idea of received pronunciation was not to create this class divide yeah it wasn't to put other people down the whole point was that let's just have one let's just have let's just decide on a standardized act standardized accent which i believe was for the media mm. whatever it was and if everyone speaks that way then we can have a um some kind of baseline mm-hmm. that everyone can speak mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And years ago, actors used to get elocution lessons, yeah, yeah. right? And not just actors, but other people, they want to work in certain industries, they, they need to go for elocution. So I'm not saying that's right, but yeah. it's just the way. It was what the market demanded at that time. Even now, of course, that's still happening. That's why a lot of people will come to people like you or me is because they say, oh, I'm feeling this societal pressure of needing to speak a certain way to get this job, to to move forward or to get the raise or whatever. And it's still a lot of like economically based things, I think, too, because prejudice just always seems to exist and we just can't get rid of it. But that, but it's not my job to tell people how to speak. My job is to give people the tools mm-hmm. to learn the modern form of received pronunciation. The problem is I have to be very, very careful. Okay, A, it's up to the students to, to decide what they want. When people find my website or they find me, they know what I teach. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them the tools to learn mm-hmm. it. I'm not going to promise people that they're going to be accepted by certain elements of society their life is going to be better that's not something that i mean people say for marketing reasons i should Mm. say this kind of stuff but i'm Mm. like look i don't like to market my courses like that i don't want to say that your life is going to be 10 times better if you learn this accent or whatever Mm. it could be it might not be but most of the students who come to me they've already decided what they want and why Mm. right Mm -hmm. the other aspect that i have to be really careful of is again depending on who you're interacting with accents can be perceived differently so amongst certain circles certain accents can be seen positively and Mm -hmm. in other circles accents can be perceived negatively and also you can have things like reverse snobbery as well so maybe people don't want to sound too posh people don't want to come across as pompous or condescending so i have this job where i have to teach people to and again I have to teach people to speak in what we call a neutral manner. What is neutral, right? right? But in a manner that some some people, when they hear the words receive pronunciation, okay, that terminology in itself might come across as quite outdated. Again, why do I use that term if it's outdated? Mm -hmm. Why do I use that term if it can be seen as divisive? The reason why I do that is because it's probably the one of the most searched terms in google for british english pronunciation it's also the term that's used in the media it's also the term that's used 
by the acting mm -hmm. and the narration industry. So I use it and it mm -hmm. works. That's mm -hmm. how people find me. But I'm not trying to promote some kind of elitism. Right. Yeah. I'm not trying to promote any kind of class divide. I'm just trying to teach people the modern form of received pronunciation, yeah. which is the ability to express themselves clearly, to be clearly understood. Mm -hmm. And that's really it. I'm not trying to the other parts of background and class and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. That's not really my that's not what I'm dealing with. Yeah, That's it's, not, a, it's the same with me. It's it's really a, an important point that you brought up is because like I advertise, I market the opposite, which is an American accent. Do I really care if you want to speak like an American, right? And but it's the thing people know, right? It's the thing that people search for. It doesn't mean in the end that's actually what they want, but it's a good starting point. And it's some words they know. It's, I have the same trouble with this term of accent reduction, right? Oh, because that sounds negative. It sounds, oh, I have to reduce my accent. And you don't want that, but that's what people search for because that's what comes to their mind because at the beginning, they don't know anything else. They don't know any other terminology, I think. It's a very sensitive topic, mm -hmm. industry profession. I don't know how to describe it exactly, but a lot of people feel very self-conscious about the way they speak. Me, I live in London. London is very international. You walk down the street, people speak in many different forms, right? Many, there's a whole diverse range of accents, whatever, like everyone is themselves. Like they speak the way they want to, as long as you understand them, that's mm -hmm. and, uh, as long as people communi can communicate clearly, that's all that really, that's all that really matters. But sorry, I lost the point that I was trying to get to. I'm trying to bring up a point. Why is my brain deviating? <laughs> I'm more about like how, the things that people might think we're marketing a certain thing. Or we're oh, yeah. So, accent, sorry, the thing not. that I now remember. So mm -hmm. this is a really sensitive topic because yeah. it's like, for example, a couple of years ago when we had the Japan Olympics with broadcast in the UK and we had a presenter yeah. on BBC and she said we're going to present the running the jogging the swimming so that she didn't do the mm sound at the end like ah, swimming running. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. and she's from a a working class a humble working class background and she worked hard to get into well, i think she was also an athlete and she worked hard to get into media and presenting and then i remember someone criticized her for not enunciating the sounds clearly like re removing the mm sound at the end right, right, like right. he said she didn't, she didn't clearly articulate uh, running and he said yeah. he understand her right mm -hmm. now her response to that was it was discriminatory because she grew up on a council estate mm -hmm. and that's the way she speaks and I he see. shouldn't he shouldn't like be expected you know. to speak in a different way and but his yeah. point was mm -hmm that he just couldn't understand her uh -huh. right it wasn't that she she spoke in a working class manner he didn't care if she spoke but he didn't care about her background he didn't care about her upbringing he was just saying that i don't i couldn't understand what she was saying and this is where everything gets very tricky uh -huh. sticky and, and, tricky sticky. and sticky yeah <laughs> and it happens that's with a native english speaker right yes. it happens a lot with non-native speakers like i remember someone telling me that people telling me that they couldn't understand the announcements made by train drivers because they were mm -hmm. speaking a strong foreign mm -hmm. accent mm -hmm. and then i've met people who have worked for example on the london underground giving announcements on a yeah. speakerphone and then someone coming up to them saying i didn't understand what you were saying and she uh -huh. got very offended by that yeah so you have these two sides. On one hand, you have people saying, look, hey, you shouldn't uh, discriminate against me because I speak with this accent. This is the way I speak, regardless mm -hmm. of whether it's a native accent or a non-native accent. A lot of people get very offended. They're very sensitive. So yeah. when I say this is what I do, a lot of people are like, why is this necessary? Right. Well, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. It's like I can see people naked without their <laughs> clothes on. The A lot of people can, I sense that, they feel very, what's the word for it? Maybe exposed in a way, vulnerable. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, they feel very vulnerable and exposed just by the mere mention of what I do. Right, right. And I'm not judging people. 
that's what people are going to, uh, going to understand and not judging people. And I didn't get into this because I woke up one day and I thought, oh, I wouldn't it be amazing if everyone spoke proper English? <laughs> that's not what happened. Yeah. If you watch like old films like My Fair Lady, that's like yeah. the perception, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's an interesting film. I got into this because there were a lot of people who really wanted to learn to speak in a certain way. And having experienced teaching, I noticed that people were really frustrated. Mm -hmm. And there are like, a, there are some accent, okay, let's use the term accent reduction schools here in London. And they charge a lot of money. I mean, they can be anywhere, they can be like $150, $200 an hour. Um, and people will spend, you know, thousands of pounds or dollars. And there's no change at the end, right? And I saw this, I hope, as long as my old my the boss of the school that I used to work at in Japan doesn't hear this, but a lot of the time students don't really get results, and you feel sorry for them, you feel bad for them, and you really want to see them. I want to provide a method that would really help people. Yeah. That's basically what it was. Let me, yeah, let me just summarize was... what you're saying so far, and because I think it's similar to what I've experienced too. It's not something that we are judging at all, right? All yeah. the accents are great. Whatever you want, it's fine. Yeah. But I, I I, went through the same thing. I saw a need. People are like, I need help with this. I want to sound a certain way. And I thought, you know what? I'm good at this. I'm good at teaching. I'm, I'm really into phonetics and sounds and how these happen. I can help you. So there's a need. We can help these people. I think that's how you came to this in the beginning. Exactly. Right? Yeah. That's really what it was. Mm -hmm. I realized there was a need and then I created a website. I called it receivepronunciation.co.uk. I noticed no one had reserved that domain name. Mm -hmm. And I created a Facebook group, also receive pronunciation. And I started getting the visitors. I worked on my website, just the website on its own didn't really bring me the traffic. Mm -hmm. But by working on my website and putting a lot of effort into it, then my Google ranking started going higher and higher. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't need to use any of those. I never used any of those teacher student matching services, but before maybe it was more word of mouth. That's how I was getting my students. Now I just get all my students through Google or mm -hmm. through my workshops, mm -hmm. which I do in person and I advertise through Eventbrite, mm -hmm. but it's a mixture of doing workshops and using those keywords, receive pronunciation. So it's right. sometimes it feels a little embarrassing using yeah. those words, but uh -huh. I don't, and I've always felt a bit embarrassed about it but on the other hand you look at any actor's profile or any like website for actors this is not for i'm not someone like imdb but these websites these directory services when you want to scout actors or narrators will always say in their profile not all the time but most of the time it'll tell you what accents they speak and it'll say mm -hmm. receive pronunciation general american mm -hmm. blah 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 so that those key words are really important and yeah. i thought look if i mean at the end of the day i need to get students i don't really want to use this term yeah but i know that's what people are looking for mm -hmm. i don't want people to misunderstand what i'm selling i don't want this to sound really pompous and over the top right but i am a lot of people they're teaching receive pronunciation but they'll call it something else they'll call it neutral english yeah, 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 yeah. but then internationally yeah, you know, people really, that's the thing, like people in the acting industry, they really, for them, it's really important. Mm -hmm. People in the narration industry, this accent is really important. Sometimes I feel it's more domestically, people put it down. They yeah. don't realize how sought after it is. Maybe there's this kind of element of reverse snobbery, like people don't want to stick out. People don't want to come across as too polished, but definitely like globally, if you're doing more global performances where you have to be, people aren't fussed with things like your background and your class and stuff mm -hmm. like that. They just want to hear a nice, clear accent that's easy to understand. Yeah. And so, I think it comes down to what you mentioned before. So we're talking about like, how do our clients find us? They have a need. We can help them with that. How do they find us? It's often through these SEO, the keywords and things yeah. like that. And they don't know. They don't know all the things that we do. We, they may not know that, oh, this term seems a little bit negative. I don't want to use this term. That's all they yeah. know. So that's how they find us. And it's the same maybe with their resumes. For example, an actor might cite a certain type of 
accent that they can do because that's what then the people who are looking at their resumes, that's all they know, exactly. right? And they don't yeah. know the intricacies of all that stuff too. So yeah, I've had the same feeling of, ooh, this is a little bit cringy, right? Using these words like accent reduction and make your accent better. What does better mean? That's a value judgment that I yeah. don't necessarily agree with. But I, I don't know if you've noticed this. I wonder if the pendulum is swinging the other way where now... The, a lot of people I think are advertising in a more, how should I say, a little bit nebulous kind of a way, right? They're say, they'll say, speak more confidently, speak more clearly. Yeah, those things are true, but then people maybe don't know that, oh, I, I can help you with this specific accent. So I, I've seen this happen recently too, is like things are becoming more, let's say, PC, but also maybe a little bit less clear as well. Have you noticed that? So when you say speak more confident, mm -hmm. a lot of people, some people who come to my workshops, they're not actually looking to change their accent. Mm -hmm. they're, they're looking to speak with confidence. And yes. People then figure out that actually what they need is not, um, they don't need to change their accent or their, their manner in articulating sounds. Maybe some of these people need a voice coach to help yeah. project their voice mm. or something. Maybe they need to take acting lessons. Maybe they need to take, for example, maybe they need to attend Toastmasters, which is mm -hmm. quite hot. Speaking confident, you can speak with any accent, speak confidently. Yeah. You can have a really strong accent. And you can own it for yeah. sure. And yeah. you can own it. But I, again, I think confidence comes from experience. Absolutely. It's the result of um, something, right? I, I can't sell you confidence, but I can, I can reinforce what you're doing that you want to do and make you realize that, oh, this, yes, this is actually what I wanted. I needed this practice. I needed this knowledge. It's often the result of what we do. So, so I, I actually have some strong thoughts about this. Ooh, tell this us. This area, because I feel like a lot of people are being, I mean, I don't want to put down people who, who, who do this for a living. I don't know. People who, can who have a good. Who do what we do for a living? Like people like us? Not us, but speech coaches, confidence coaches, like how to speak with confidence, which is different from mm. what we do, mm. right? So I don't, you know, when students come to me and they say, how can I speak more confidently? I say, well, you need more experience. You know, if you need to pitch an idea to your colleagues or your boss, you just need more experience doing that. If you need to give a presentation, well, you just need more experience giving presentations. I've you know, I've been thrown into, into a conference room and asked to, this was years ago, like I was translating my boss's document and then we went on a business trip to Korea and at some kind of hospital, some institution. And I translated his presentation into English because it needed to be present, presented in English. And there were like hundreds of people there. And then suddenly it's okay, now I want you to present it. And I had no experience <laughs> doing it. <this. laughs> and I felt really nervous mm -hmm. but why was i nervous i was nervous because i just didn't have experience doing this like i was mm -hmm. thrown into a room with lots of people and i say to people look you know the more experience you have doing this the more experience you have talking in front of lots of people and i had this with a friend on clubhouse because she used to do like these rooms on clubhouse and she'd have 10 people 20 people 30 people 50 people sometimes 100 or 200 mm -hmm. and she was always really confident but then once i remember she went into a room with like thousands of people and she spoke and she told me how she didn't feel confident like she actually felt nervous and the reason why she felt nervous because she wasn't used to it mm -hmm. is if you were suddenly to go live on tv and you never had experience being live on tv you'd feel nervous but the more experience you have doing that the more confident and the more relaxed you become and that's what i that's the thing i think about public speaking and the other thing is that i have against this thing of learning to speak confidently is that people think that if you exude confidence, then people are more likely to listen to you. Mm. What I think is important is that the idea that you're discussing is genuinely interesting. Mm. And I, for example, like Ted talks, right? I used to love watching Ted talks, but I've, but over the years, I just began to lose interest because I just felt like people were just doing all these techniques, like all these things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, going yeah. on stage, talking with confidence, speaking really loudly. But then I was just thinking, I don't really, as long as I can hear them, mm -hmm. as long as I can understand what they're saying, I just want them to talk about something that's really interesting. I don't want them to go. And sometimes lacking confidence or seeming a little less confident can actually be quite nice. Mm. Do you really want someone going out on stage like, full confidence just talking about some random subject 
that perhaps you're just not really interested in. And that's what I noticed because all the people that I like to listen to when I watch presentations, it's because of the actual content. No amount of telling people to do like eye contact mm -hmm. or how to move mm -hmm. their hands or how to start in front of a podium is going to make, I don't know, not me. I mean, yeah. I'm, it's not going to make me more interested just because, yeah, these are small things. You, you want to be personable. You want to be friendly. You want to engage people. I understand that. You don't want to be dismissive. You don't want to be rude. But I think these are skills that we all inherently have. Mm. It's all within us. And then sometimes people just lose the confidence or they yeah. feel they need help or, the or something. But I just don't feel like moving your hands in a certain way. <laughs> A lot of that's just gravy, right? If you don't have the content, if you don't have the message that is is really reaching that particular audience, whatever that might be, then what's the point? Because what you're now describing is more like your vo voice in terms of personality, your idiolect. Like, how does this person come across? Because if we all do all of those things, it's just going to be a bunch of us being loud and obnoxious and doing all the same things at the same time. But for example, you're doing something that nobody else can do, right? You're telling us stories that pertain yeah. to your life and we're connecting with yeah. you and your life. And you can teach a lot of storytelling, but you can't give everybody else your stories. It just doesn't land the same. So messaging, I would say the content, making it personal and personable, even if that means, as you said, like this person looks a little timid, they look a little shy, they have a very specific quality to their voice that maybe Somebody isn't going to say, here's how you should sound. Use this quality of your voice. No, but that's that person. And we connect right. with that person in the end. I, I listen to, sometimes I listen to audio books. And again, I'm not an expert on narration or anything, but a lot of the more recently narrated audio books just really annoy me, like the <laughs> voices they use. Like they try and make it sound, they try and make the narration sound more interesting mm. and they use this kind of weird kind of intonation as if they're talking about some i don't know like some kind of like spooky intriguing <laughs> thing like, like today we're going to present to you we're going to yeah. talk about this right yeah. and you've got this kind of up and down and then but some of these like really old these really old audio books like recorded like decades ago where they talk with a really monotone flat mm -hmm. you know personality it's a lot easier to listen to mm. right for me like mm. the other people i feel like they're just winding me up yeah they're yeah. constantly trying to provoke a reaction right they constantly like do this rising intonation falling intonation they, mm. they, they're trying to create some intrigue the they're intrigue's already there maybe. in the story mm -hmm. sorry they're, maybe they're compensating for yeah. the, the content not being good enough in a way or to That's me it right. annoys me because i'm like I'm already here. I've already bought the book. I'm already going to exactly. listen. You don't have exactly. to sell it anymore. But that's why for me personally, okay, I don't want to have a go at these people, but I prefer, I'd rather listen to machine narrated mm -hmm. content mm -hmm. because the machine narrated content would just do it in a neutral monotone voice. Yeah. When the and I know it's not crazy, but it's just, I think there's too much arousal going on, mm. right? It's creating too much arousal in the brain with this constant, you know, up and down. Yeah. Like they're trying to get you to listen. Are you listening to what I'm saying? <laughs> it's really important. I need to hit you over the head with it right. in a way. Right. It but getting back me, to Oh, sorry. Well, let me just interject. It sorry, reminds go ahead. me of what sorry, you yeah. said earlier about Japan and how yeah. Americans are perceived as being over the top, more dynamic speakers, whereas most British speakers are perceived as more reserved, more monotone and things like that. And, and I can imagine how our speaking style comes on a bit strong for some people and it maybe even turns them off in a way that you're describing like the... I, I don't... I think it's there's a stereotype perception mm -hmm. for that Americans speak that way. I don't believe all Americans mm -hmm. speak that way because oh, yeah. a lot of audiobooks that I've listened to that are narrated really well are American narrators. Mm -hmm. But they don't have that hyperactive tendency when the narrating is just very flat. Yeah, it's yeah. very monotone and it's easy to listen to. I can listen to it for a long time. But going back to the presentation skills, you know, confidence, mm -hmm. I would say that the ability to articulate yourself. So again, this is not pronunciation. This is an accent, but this is also, these are also important skills to have. And these are skills that I need to 
be wary of. It's the ability to articulate. It's the ability to articulate your thoughts clearly and concisely. If you're giving a presentation or a workshop, time is limited, and you don't want to keep on repeating the same thing. And you want to give people clear and easy to understand instructions. And I would say again, that's really important, right? Mm-hmm. That's why I say, way the yeah, being personable, interacting with people, engaging people. Yes, that's important. Did you move your hands in this way? What power pose are you doing in front of your guests or whatever? I just feel like if you are genuinely interested in what you're doing mm-hmm. and you're genuinely committed, it's going to come out. Yeah. People are going to see it. The thing is, this is the point that I'm trying to make, is that as humans, we have this innate ability to express ourselves if we really want to. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think it's something, and this is what kind of frustrates me, because people believe that, well, either they've got to be someone else or they've got to learn to express themselves mm. in a certain way. I think it. I think everyone has that. That's just my personal belief. I, I believe everyone has that ability, but what's really important, and it will come out after a while, as long as you are, gen- and if you're not, and that's the thing, if you're not genuinely interested in what you're talking about, that's the real problem, <laughs> right? Not actually being committed or invested mm. in the subject mm-hmm. that you're about to discuss. That's where someone's, I've been to Toastmasters and they'll say, okay, we want you to discuss this topic. Yeah. Yeah, but if it's a topic that I'm not interested in, then I'm not going to do a, a good job, right? That's I'm not invested in it. But if it's something that I'm passionate about, it's going to be a lot more, my my manner, my style of presenting is going to be a lot more engaging. Yeah. But, You're reminding me of yeah. something to, to extend the trend. And then I want to hear more about more about your teaching methods too and how that's related to what we're talking about because it's leading me to that point. But you just reminded me that I've seen now this trend as well, visually, right? So you talked about a power pose, right? Standing in front of a live audience, but look what's happening in social media too, in all the videos, right? It's all about, oh, you have to cut and zoom in on your face every three seconds and there has to be something that pops up and you have to have bells and whistles. And and it's more about that than the actual message it seems. Or maybe that's a way, like we said, to camouflage that lack of interesting content. YouTube and social media is different because you're, and I, again, I'm not an expert in this field, but from what I understand, you're dealing with the algorithms and you're mm. dealing with advertisers and advertising mm. and you're fighting for time. Mm. So people's attention span is limited. True. So every different platform or form of media has to be presented in a different way, depending on how much time is available. So for example, I sell some courses on Udemy. I have some course on Thinkific. When people buy a course, they're already invested. They've already bought it. Yeah, yeah. It's up to people, once they purchase my course, it's up to them to decide whether to continue watching or not. I don't need to do these rules of constantly making it engaging because if people are not interested, I don't have to keep them engaged. I'm not making money. I have to keep them engaged, but not in that manner, right? I'm not, I don't have to keep them engaged in every single second of the Mm. video they're watching and if they need that then probably my course just isn't (laughs) that that's something else right that and that's youtube that's instagram perhaps facebook to some degree i don't know but i'm i don't have a huge i don't really have i mean i have a youtube account with videos i've uploaded to youtube i have a video on youtube with with 2.4 million hits but again that was on that was because i was on a japanese tv show and that was only like one minute long but when you're dealing with social media, it's very, you have to know what you're doing because people have short attention spans. But the other thing you've got to be really careful of is because I have a lot of, I know a lot of people that try and use social media to, to increase their business. A lot of people who watch your content might not be your customers. Mm, mm-hmm. Most of the people probably aren't your customers and your customers are very different from the people that are actually watching and I have this with my people think I've got to have a Facebook page page I have to have an Insta I have to have an Instagram account I have to have this I have to have the other I have to do at least one post a day mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it, it, it was like this with Clubhouse too like yeah. the people that wanted lessons what would happen is they would come in to my rooms they wouldn't really participate they wouldn't really participate and then they would contact me later and they would say I just want lessons Right. I don't need any, I don't, yeah. I don't want to watch your Instagram. Mm-hmm. I don't want to come into your group sessions. It's the same with my workshops in London. Like I do these workshops in London and the people that want lessons w- don't really come to my workshop, 
but the workshop kind of makes them aware of, of what I do. Yeah, it's right. Like a portfolio almost. It, it like shows your work. Mm -hmm. It shows your work, but some people will they'll watch all your free content online, mm -hmm. but they never have. They might never have any intention to buy anything from you. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're really genuinely happy about providing free content, okay, fine, do it. Keep on mm -hmm. doing it. But if you're doing this because you want to convert them into customers, mm -hmm. you might get really frustrated. And right. that's why I don't spend too much time with Instagram because my time is limited. I'm creating my courses. I spend a lot of time on my courses. Mm -hmm. I spend more time writing articles for my website, making my course structure clearer, make it easy to follow because the people that generally are interested actually read through my website. Yeah. They actually read about what I do. And when they come to me for my consultation, they just, they've already made up their mind. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just a confirmation, really. It seems like mm -hmm. I think I'm doing the Pretty right much. thing. Let me just check because I've I've seen what he does. I see I've I've read about it. Yeah, I've maybe I've seen right. a couple samples on like social media. I know this person's personality, I think will go well. Yeah, it's the same thing, right? So once they're already there, they're already there. They're just checking that they've made yeah. the right choice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So speaking of which then, so tell us a little bit more about like how you teach, because I think we're touching a lot on what we might call authenticity, right? right? And how we're all very right. different. And like we said earlier, we all, we collaborate because nobody needs to step on anybody else's toes and we're all very different and we, we celebrate that. So tell us a little bit about you and why you might be different than how I teach, for example, and what kinds of things we can find you for. So my, my background, my university degree my first degree was in was mathematics. So I come from this logical background. Mm -hmm. um, okay, my second language is French. Mm -hmm. um, I studied French at school, mm -hmm. spent a lot of time visiting France. Um, then my third language, so that was growing up, that was part of compulsory education, just mm. the general culture and environment. I learned French, picked it up. My French isn't perfect. Still need to work on a bit. Did a degree in French as well. Ah, uh, me too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not, so not a my degree actually, but I was I first started in French as a French major and worked in French phonetics and things like yeah. that too. So I think we have that in common, which I never knew about you. So that's super interesting. Yeah. So my second language is French. Yeah. And then my third language is Japanese, mm. and so that's why I spent quite a bit of time in Japan. Mm -hmm. So I had there's two sides to me. The 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 scientific side, the mathematical side where one plus one is equal to two, one minus one is equal to zero. <laughs> it almost is yes or no kind of binary logical side. So something can either be true or false, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And then there's this kind of this language side of me, right? And so when I was learning Japanese, Japanese, I, it's a language that I learned on my own because I didn't want to be, you know, the experience that I had learning French and other disciplines is it, it's really frustrating when you're in a classroom and you feel that you're constantly dependent on the teacher to help you improve, like the teacher's feedback. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you get positive feedback and other times you get negative feedback. And sometimes you go into these like negative loop spirals where you just don't know what you're doing wrong. You don't know why you're improving. Sometimes you go into these positive loop sp spirals where you seem to be making a lot of progress. And Japanese is a language that I thought, look, I want to study this using my own. I just want to study this on my own. Initially, it was just like for fun, hmm. but I started doing a lot of research and I didn't want to go to a classroom. I didn't want to have a Japanese teacher telling me what to do because Japanese is a different, difficult language for anyone coming through from a European language, right? It's quite tough because they're different. That's really what it is. It's not that it's difficult in itself. It's just very different. Hmm. I decided I wanted to apply a logical mindset to learning Japanese and the, the writing system was quite complex. It has a complex writing system. And again, it's not that it's difficult, it's that you have to have a logical process. So I bought, I used to buy a lot of books. I had a lot of audio programs. Like I use things like Pimsler's Audio, which yeah, I don't know yeah, if it's yeah. still around now, but <laughs> they, yeah, they have Pims and I, they have Pimsler for different languages. And I remember using Pimsler's Audio and I found that really effective. Mm -hmm. And the thing I loved about, I mean, it was very simple, like the level, the basic, the, the level you could go to, but I was constantly like analyzing these. I was into using things like mnemonics, time repetition. Like I wanted to find, 
you know, I looked up, for example, what are the tools that linguists use? No, not linguists, mm. the, the people that speak more than like polyglots. several languages. Yeah, polyglots. Yeah, yeah. Well, what you do they find use? your own system that right. works for you. It sounds like and I, I started on. reading about all the mechanisms, like the mind mapping, the thinking process, mm. like how can you really think like a native speaker? I don't want to learn it as a foreigner. I don't want to learn and people say, hey, well done. That's really good. Your, your Japanese is really good for a foreigner. I don't want to be like that. Yeah, I want to. Yeah, I want to learn the thinking process. It's a mm. bit like it's a bit like a computer, right? You can have an Apple Mac or a Windows PC. You can have Apple software and Windows software. Either you wipe the hard drive and you install <laughs> Mac OS or you install Windows, but emulating software on another hard drive is not efficient. And that's what I felt it was like. It's when they say, when you learn another language, you need to learn to think in that language. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you learn to translate, it's not good because you're constantly thinking in your native language. So I was, I was trying to learn how to think like a Japanese person, yeah. like learning the thought process. So I was trying to wipe my brain from English and start from scratch with Japanese. So I had a lot of experience using a lot of, using a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. I really put in a lot of time finding as many resources as possible. And that really helped me. It really helped me advance my Japanese. So when I went to Japan, I was able, I, I could survive. I could communicate. People thought that I'd lived in Japan for a lot longer than I had. Mm -hmm. On one hand, it was a bit embarrassing because then people think well, you're one of these like really geeky people that can learn any language, but actually, no, you're putting a lot of time, a lot of effort into mm -hmm. it. And then they see a foreigner, a Westerner speaking Japanese, and it looks a bit odd and you look a bit out of place. And mm -hmm. that's something else I don't really want to. Yeah, you know what that makes me think of, you know, what annoys me to no end is when if I'm speaking French or I also have some Arabic and some Spanish, if I'm speaking another language, two things. Number one, when someone says, oh, you're so lucky. Oh, you're so lucky. I'm like, I'm not lucky. I worked hard at this. And I like, exactly. I'd like you to recognize that. It's really hard to learn another language, languages. Yeah. And the other thing that it reminds me of too, I don't know if you had this trouble because your level was high in Japanese. Did you have this happen to you where you're making headway in the conversation and then somebody thinks suddenly that you you know so much that they jump way ahead in the vocabulary that they're using and suddenly you can't. Like, it, it almost gives them a false sense of how good you are. Oh, I mean, that, that doesn't really happen in Japanese. Okay. Usually the opposite happens. Ah. People will never believe that. You, uh, and again, I don't want to... I could start criticizing Japanese society and the way Japanese people think, so I've got to be careful what I say. But I just remember sometimes, for example, if I'd go to my bank in Tokyo because I needed to like do a bank transfer and I'd speak to them in Japanese and they, they would start using all these baby words with me uh, because they just assumed that you're a foreigner, so we uh -huh. need to use like what we call foreign loan right. words imported into the Japanese vocabulary from English and other countries because they think it's going to be easier for you to understand. And it's like a form of discrimination, but they think they're being helpful, but mm. it's really just annoying kind of and condescending. I had that happen to me quite a few times. That's another subject we can talk about. Mm -hmm. I could talk about that for hours and hours another and hours. And again, <laughs> yeah. And I don't, I wouldn't, I can't really blame Japanese people. And my Japanese isn't perfect either. Yeah. There's always something new you can learn. Yeah in any language it's a lifelong it doesn't matter how fluent you think you are it's a lifelong discipline mm -hmm. but going back to the my my teaching method so i had a lot of experience this is the thing i found when i was when i went to japan okay my passion was more to do with translation i wanted to be a translation i didn't want to be a an english teacher mm -hmm. i didn't want to waste my time teaching english mm -hmm. but then when i was teaching english then i thought i might as well take advantage of this opportunity and think of some more innovative effective techniques where I can help people all these different aspects like for example so when I was working at this pronunciation school in Japan I started applying techniques that I had used myself mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. learning spacing the sounds and the repetition right helping students internalize the sounds so what I realized is there's two aspects to this one is the ability to hear the sounds to hear the sounds mm -hmm. of English a lot of people they can't even hear the sounds and then the other aspect is the ability to replicate the sounds, yeah. okay? The ability to hear the sounds, okay, that's through studying the, the phonetics, studying the vowel sounds, studying the 20 different vowels of British English pronunciation, studying the, the 24 consonant sounds, listening to the sounds and learning their positions on the vowel sound chart, learning 
just learning to recognize the sounds, right? Hearing it. It's just hearing the sounds, right? And that I don't think is too difficult. Okay. So in my teaching program, I separate it between input and output. Okay. Mm -hmm. The ability to hear the sound. So if someone has lived in an English speaking environment for a long time, usually they have a good ear, usually not all the time, but that's when I'm dealing with a teacher that when I'm, when I'm dealing with a student who has learned English in their own country, but has never actually spent much time in a native English speaking country or hasn't spent much time actually listening to the sounds of English, whether it's watching television or listening to the radio or podcasts or videos on the internet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then usually they need to work on developing their ear, right? They need to get used to hearing the sounds. That's what, that's like the first step, like just being able to recognize that there's a difference between, for example, the at sound as in hat and the R sound as in heart, just being able to hear the sound. And a lot of students, or the art sound as in hut and the at sound as in hat. Mm -hmm. And when I do my workshops, a lot of students, they can't hear the mm -hmm. difference. It's like driving them crazy. It's, it's the same sound, it's just at, because in their, like maybe their native language is Spanish or something, and they might just have an at sound or something, mm -hmm. right? So that's stage one. And I don't think that's too difficult, but it is odd because people can, with the English language, because people can become really fluent in English and they could understand what people are saying, but they can't distinguish between the vowel sounds unless they do a lot of training. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next aspect to it is the ability to articulate the sounds, yes. right? And this is the whole aspect of muscle memory. You know, depending on someone's linguistic background, they have grown up you know, using different aspects of the articulators, the mouth, mm -hmm. the lips, the tongue, the vocals, where do they create those sounds? So in certain languages, the sounds might come more from the back of the mouth. And I think voice coaches talk a bit about this as well. Mm -hmm. For example, Spanish, spe Spanish speakers can have this strong sound coming from the mm -hmm. back, just like mm -hmm. Greek speakers. Some languages can be more guttural. Some languages, like for example, if I've got a, if I've got a Iranian student, they tend to use the velum area. So it sounds like this constant wine <laughs> some students they can have this kind of recoil at the back of the mouth mm -hmm. so it's help it's about helping like russian students there's a lot of movement in the, the mid back of the tongue right there's these there's a lot of these dark l sounds right so some students they might rattle the tongue a bit more so it's about teaching it's about helping them observe yeah. their own speech mechanisms mm -hmm. in their native language mm -hmm. right and Okay, it's all very well to help students observe it and to recognize it, but how do you change it? Yeah. So then we do a lot of these, again, this is a crossover with speech therapy. I don't consider myself a speech therapist, mm. right? But speech therapists, I believe they, a lot of them, they help children. You, that, that's, it's usually common with either children or people with actual physical disorders or mental disorders. And again, I'm not an expert on this area. This is why I've got to be careful what I say. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people in these in the in these professions can often be helping people that actually have like speech impediments. Yeah. But when I have a non-native English speaker that really struggles to articulate the sounds, they have to learn about how they're using their articulators, how they're using their vocal cords in their own native language, and why that's preventing them from articulating the sounds correctly. And that's why students get most students they try and get help with their pronunciation. Okay, pronunciation, accent, what's the different? These two words are used interchangeably. Mm -hmm. Let's start with pronunciation, which is the very fundamentals of the building blocks of how we articulate the sounds. Mm. The problem is most, most students try and seek help from an English teacher. Mm. And an English teacher is teaching English. And yes, they can teach you like the vowel sounds, the consonant sounds. Yes, they can teach you the phonetics, the phonetic script. They can tell you this is a monothong, this is a diphthong. But is the English teacher an, ex an expert or have they spent a long, have they spent a significant amount of time or a sufficient amount of time? You don't, you don't have to be an expert to teach any of this, right? Mm. You, just having some knowledge can help a student, right? It's not mm. like someone has to spend a lot of time like me or you teaching this to help a student. Sometimes students can get help even from an English teacher, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is an English teacher's probably, maybe they haven't spent, invested enough time kind of researching this helping students and then the students get very frustrated yeah. because they're really having difficulty understanding how they're articulating sounds and when you have students from different linguistic backgrounds with completely different problems 
steps. Mm -hmm. This is another hurdle that we've got to get over. So as a teacher myself, every time I get a student from a different background, a, a student that I haven't taught before from a new country, from a country that I've never taught before, then I have to spend more time researching like how they create these sounds, how they articulate these mm -hmm. sounds. And then we have to do exercise. It's like basic, okay, we can call these speech therapy exercises mm -hmm. where we look at the very fundamental components of the sounds, mm -hmm. right? So for example, like if we look at plosive sounds, if, we, if I say the word butter, mm -hmm. right? American English, you tend to replace it with a dirt like butter, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then you tend to have, add some rotisity at that, right? But let's take the word butter, right? A lot of students can't pronounce that t sound, mm -hmm. okay? And initially, I had this experience with, I started with Japanese people, and I realized, actually, not just Japanese people, many different countries have this mm -hmm. problem. This, this British t sound, especially the RP t sound, yeah. is, is very much aspirated out of mm -hmm. the front mm -hmm. of the mouth. So I started developing these techniques where we just go through the basic sounds, the basic phonemes, the things like p, b, t, d, k, k, like a baby would, right? Yeah, yeah. And especially for my students that, because I have students who just need to push in the right direction. Like I could just say the cat's out on the mat. And as long as they hear it being enunciated, perfectly then they can repeat it back perfectly but then i have students that they just can't they can't even say one sound one word because their articulators have been formed to move in a completely different manner and the problem is when you're an adult and you are english is your second language and you are fluent in english to a professional level it gives you this kind of false sense of confidence mm -hmm. because you think, hang on, this is just basic. Uh, this is just the basic articulation of sounds. Why do I need to spend all this time saying t? I'm not a baby, yeah, right? Yeah. But a lot of students they really do need this help. So my my method basically follows this process for the students. I'm talking about like the students that really that have a really strong accent, mm -hmm. right, and want to get to that perfect RP accent. So yes, we, we yes. start with the basic building blocks, yeah. just the basic sounds. And I try to disconnect the sounds from the words. So for example, like sometimes I get American, I get American students, right? Americans, perhaps they're actors and they want to learn to speak with a British RP accent. If I say butter, they're going to say butter. Mm -hmm. If I say brother, they're going to say brother. But I say, I didn't say brother, I said brother. But it's the filter, it's the internal language filter. So what we'll do is we'll do exercises and then they'll say tur, tur, tur. But as soon as I, I say butter, they'll say butter, right? <laughs> yes. They don't know why they're doing it, right? But that's just an example. And it happens with people from other linguistic, yeah. with other, from other language backgrounds, but that's just an example with a native mm -hmm. English speaker. And then again, I believe that general, general American English and received pronunciation, I believe they're very close in the way we aspirate sounds. Yeah. So when I'm teaching an American student, I don't have to spend time explaining things that I'd have to explain to, for example, a Chinese student. Mm -hmm. We do very different exercises. Mm -hmm. So if I have a student from East Asian countries, such as Japan, China, then we would spend time just on the basic, the ability to articulate basic sounds like r, yeah. basic friction, and even that sound f, v, th, could be very difficult for some people. But if they do this for three or four months, then after a while, okay, now they're just getting through the basic frictors. But a lot of people think, why should I spend three months mm -hmm. just learning to say p, b, t, k, Because you've spent g. 20 years doing the other thing and you've got to go right. back and change it. And, and exactly. changing those neural pathways is really difficult because your brain is going to convince you that it's right, but what you want is a different thing. So it's a but really it, difficult it, process. But it, it's about managing expectations and it mm -hmm. can be done. And this is the frustration I had when I was working at these schools in Japan because the schools would promise the student you will speak with a perfect British accent within three months. It wasn't mm -hmm. going to happen. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is also about managing people's expectations with yeah, what I do. Yeah. So we start with the basic sounds. Now we're going to do basic words, just simple or, or basic syllables. We're just going to do syllables and then words. And then, then after a few months, we might do like just two words, three words, mm -hmm. four words. And I've had this, I have a student, I've been teaching him since February. The very beginning, he couldn't, he had difficulty articulating the basic sounds. Now we're reading books. We're reading mm -hmm. children's books. Very nice. And I'm getting him to repeat back three or four words at a time. And he's learning, you know, the breathing mechanisms, how mm -hmm. to, this is the other thing 
how do we pause yes. and they don't talk a, they don't talk a, about this a lot in phonetics but mm -hmm. i've got a book phonetics for dummies and it talks about yeah we'll talk about plosives fricatives right you know stop consonants glottal stops it will give you all the technical information but what it won't talk about is how i guess the rhythm yeah, and i believe a lot of it comes from the breathing mm. because yeah. as english speakers and this is where general american and british english receive pronunciation we have a lot in common i believe our lungs we're using the same language at the end of the day our lungs work in a very similar manner mm -hmm. right we might use i might use fewer rhotic sounds and you might use you might replace certain sounds here and there you might use a different syllable stress but fundamentally yeah. the mechanisms are extremely similar mm -hmm. because the way we stop and we pause and we breathe yeah you can have a different tone a different intonation but the thing is a lot of students they cannot because when you speak with a language with like similar syllable stress like spanish or japanese like, 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 like the tongue just moves rapidly back and forth mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but when we talk we take these pauses to breathe in mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. to aspirate the next sound yeah. because we have stress and unstressed syllables and they don't really talk a lot about this in yeah. in in phonetics books and it's very difficult it took me a long time to actually recognize it and to actually pinpoint it and that's why a lot of students when they try and re when they try and do long sentences or they try and do they try and repeat words with many syllables the reason why they struggle is because the vocal the lungs work in tandem with the articulators yeah. and it's all about how you prepare that the air to reach those articulators a lot of people complain that my courses are just too technical they're too mm -hmm. academic but again this is my background so it's not for everyone yeah if you definitely. get what i'm saying yeah um, absolutely and it's yeah. like the so i want to summarize what you're saying because i think we do things in a very similar way in terms of our, our methodology and where we're coming from and what we think is important so i want to summarize you want to discriminate the sounds right you want to start with the ears right. i do the same thing you right. mentioned then to articulate in the same manner, but then you went back and you said, oh, but we want to observe the mechanisms, right? So yeah, right. to me, there's very often like a, a lack of information there, right? And that's nobody's fault because nobody teaches that, right? As you said, we are specialized. And English teachers, they don't have time because they're busy doing all the other stuff for language. And so, yeah, just all this information that you can't observe unless you know it. So knowing those things and what you said is really important, breaking down the sounds and just getting to that isolated, perfect sound. And how is it different? As you said, let's say, for example, in Russian, the amount of pressure that you just use for your tongue might be different right. for some of their, they call them hard and soft sounds, which we don't have, exactly. but they might exactly. be doing it differently based on just based on their background. So you've got, you, you said breaking down the sounds to the building blocks and then progressing from there to more complex compound things, adding it into words, forming sentences. It's all these things that it's a, it's such a process. And I feel like we're on the same page, which means that we need to meet people where they're at. And also there's things that people don't even think about like, how do we breathe, right? Where do we pause? When do we stop and think? Where, where, if, I, if not, I might yeah. not be able to get through the end of the sentence the way I would if I were a native speaker. And so all there's just so many complexities, I feel like, that that people don't even realize, right? As you said, they come for pronunciation, but they stay for everything else because they don't even realize. And, and I, I find that people really get into this too maybe i convert them into like language nerds as well and i'm sure i'm sure that's happened to you even though as you said oh sometimes it's too technical sometimes it's too academic but there are a lot of people out there that once they realize these things they really get into it so maybe we can just talk for a few minutes about your courses before we wrap this up yeah. and what people can do to work with you now that we know how you teach we know a little bit about your personality there might be some people out there who want to work specifically with you for rp so what do you how can you help people Okay, so I, I have, I have two courses. One is my student correction course. So that course, that course, I corrected people on camera. So you can mm -hmm. observe how I correct people from different backgrounds. It's more of a video course. There aren't really any, there's a few exercises on it. I have it on Udemy. I also have it on Thinkific. It's better on Thinkific. And then I have my main course. So my main course is a course that I actually created for my students, but anyone can buy it. Mm. So it takes students about 60 hours to complete. Mm. 
I just found I was spending way too much time explaining all these concepts during my lessons. Mm. You know, students want, when students pay for lessons, they want instant feedback and results. They don't want me to drone on for hours and hours on the mechanisms of speech and pronunciation mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the sounds. So I created a course where I created a lot of videos to help people identify the sounds. So it mm -hmm. starts with, chapter one starts with an overview of all the sounds of English, the monophone chart, the diphthong vowel sound chart, stressed and unstressed syllables. Everything is presented in a very short and concise manner. Everything is condensed in chapter one. Like chapter one is like a quick, is an overview of everything you're going to learn in the subsequent chapters. Then chapter number two, people learn the 20 different, people learn the 12, no, people learn the five, no, the 12, no, the seven. So we've got the short vowels and we've got, people learn the, the short vowel sounds of mm -hmm. English. And then the next chapter, they learn the long vowels and the diphthong vowels. And then there's lots of reviews and lots of quizzes. So I create a lot of videos where I film native English speakers. Mm. I film their dialogues and conversations, and then I created exercises out of those videos. Awesome. So I put in a lot of quizzes, mm. exercises, PDFs. So that's very much on the input side. Nice. So it's all part of the feedback loop, right? Yeah. But anyone can buy that course. Like a lot of, I mean, it sells for 150 pounds. Some people think it's expensive, but actually it's quite long and it's quite extensive. Mm. Um, some of my students, it can take them up to a year to complete it, yeah. even longer. A lot of students never complete it. Mm -hmm. But if someone wants to study everything on their own, I really recommend mm -hmm. that course. And then there's a discussion panel and there's a free preview if people want to try it out. And I create a lot of skits, like a lot of cultural skits. So it's also important for people to be entertained and not to be bored when they're learning the stuff. Yeah. Um, so people should take a look at that. And that was made for my students as well. That was made with my students in mind. So when students sign up for my lessons, I tell them, look, you've got to buy my course first. Yes, you've got to yes. start with chapter one, mm -hmm. do the exercises. And then as we do the lessons, I can refer to them to go and do their homework mm -hmm. in the course. Mm -hmm. Because I made that course for my students. If I give them a phonetics, te textbooks are outdated. Textbooks, in you know getting out a cd or downloading the mp3 it's just the whole thing is clunky maybe apps can work but then again they're limited in their scope mm -hmm. so this course was made specifically for my students to make the whole learning process more efficient uh -huh. because the actual lesson is focused on output mm -hmm. the actual lesson is focused on adjusting and correcting the positioning of the articulators yeah. now the next stage to that is what I call my daily training program. So my daily training program is an extension of the output that they get from the lessons. So at the moment, it's got six or seven hours of audio content. And again, it uses space repetition. Hold on a second. I've got a really loud plane overhead. <laughs> I wasn't sure. able to mute it in time. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, we've got probably like Five, 10 minutes left. So let me just rewind, not rewind, but let's edit that part out because now the plane is gone. Go back and start telling me about, about the, the output. Yeah, the output and the one-on-one, -on -one, daily, yeah, so, the daily one. Mm -hmm. So for the output mechanism, we have the lessons where I correct the students. I listen to them, well, I get them to repeat sounds and then I, adjust, I help them reposition their articulators, like explain how they should articulate sounds. The problem is even if you explain something it still can be very difficult for them to repeat that sound. So you have to give them exercises to help them reach that stage, mm -hmm. right? So some st students, they need to take a step back. Some students need to take two steps back. You need to take as many steps back until that sound can be, until the student can understand how to articulate those sounds and then gradually connect them again, right? Mm -hmm. So again, the lessons are very much output focused. And to complement those lessons, I created what I call the daily training program. So unlike my online course, which is input focused, the daily training program is an extension of my lessons, which is output focused. So it's over six or seven hours, and it's a series of audio repetition exercises where people listen to sounds and they repeat them again and again, because at the end of the day, repetition. people have to do some practice every day, but it's unreasonable to expect students to take a lesson every day. They right. But I feel that repetition that students... in there and they can really get the right. muscle memory. It's about, yeah. So it's about internalizing the sounds, but the problem is if they do the daily training program without the lessons, maybe they don't know what they're doing. Some people mm. probably could do it, but I only, the daily training program is only really available to those who take my lessons. At some point, maybe I'll sell it on its own. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But that goes back to my whole, my experience of learning Japanese. Like, 
how do you internalize certain sounds of a language, right? Yeah. How do you make it second nature? That's something that people don't get from a class mm -hmm. in general. So you can go to an accent reduction school and yeah, they're going to point out your problems. They're going to tell you what's wrong. They need, they're going to tell you what to change. But how do you internalize that mechanism? That's mm -hmm. why I created the daily training. So it all goes through this feedback loop. Yeah, yeah. And that's really important. And I've had really good results. But this is why I'm so busy these days, because I'm not just teaching my students, but I'm also spending a lot of time, you know, perfecting that feedback loop in yeah, the course. Yeah. So I don't really want people to, I don't try and sell my courses. I don't try and get people to enroll in my course. People mm -hmm. will find me and they would have already made the decision. Yeah. I mean, there's enough people. And if people are not, if people don't, I'm not saying people have to study really hard. I'm not saying people have to study every day, but people have to have some level of commitment mm -hmm. or people have to have some level of desire to do this. And if they don't, that's absolutely fine. It's absolutely fine. Maybe it's not for them, but I'm really, I really want to help the people that are genuinely looking for the, you know, the mechanisms that will really help them. Mm. And so that's where I feel a lot of responsibility to make sure that those materials are available. What can I do to make this course as efficient and effective as possible? What, how can I explain this in a manner that will help the student internalize these sounds? And it's really fun because when you've been teaching a student for months and gradually you begin to see change and the seeds that you sowed months ago are beginning to sprout. Really take right? hold. You're, yeah. Right. It's beginning to take hold and you're really beginning to see change. And the problem is that people go in general, this is what I see. People go to an accent reduction school. They pay for a series of 10, 20 lessons. They pay thousands of dollars. And then they go back to their friends and say, oh, I, you sound the same. And they feel mm -hmm. really and this is where I feel a lot of responsibility because I just don't want that to happen with my students. Yeah. And they might feel it's you them know? too. They might feel, oh my God, I went, I did this amazing course. It's got all these great reviews, but if it's not personalized, if it doesn't go through the, the steps, I think it's useless. And so some people might look at what we do and say, oh, those one-on-one -on -one sessions, they're so expensive, but it doesn't waste your time. It's quick. We know exactly what people want we or need. We meet them where they're at. We give them the strategies and the skills to really make it long lasting, like this really long lasting change. Yeah. And I think that's where we both are in very much agreement about what we do. So people that, can, yeah. can find your yeah. courses, they can find you online. Are yeah. there any last thoughts that you wanted to add to this? Because we talked a lot about like our backgrounds, we talked about why it's important and what we think is important, I think, in accent coaching and what we do, how we both have very similar methods in the end. And I always love to ask other teachers too, like, what, do, what are you offering? How do you do it? Do you do like a DIY course? Do you do one-on-one? -on -one? Some people do an audio program. And I, I love to hear about how people go about this. So how we can meet everybody's needs so that it is something that really sticks with them and sprouts with them. So is, it, yeah, is there so anything I mean, else that you haven't mentioned yet that you want to talk about? I would just say to people, take a look at my website, read mm -hmm. through my website. I have a lot of articles there. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe there are some things that I've missed. Yeah. But, you know, read through it. Take a look at my courses. Follow me on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And if people have, they could join my Facebook group as well, although that I haven't really put much attention to. But not everyone has to take um, lessons. It's not like you have to have one on one lessons. That's why I created my online course. People could just buy my course, they can enroll in it, they can do the exercises, they'll get a better understanding of, of the sounds of British English pronunciation, received pronunciation, and they might just enjoy it. It's not necessarily about speaking with a perfect mm. British RP accent. It, it could just be a fun process if they want to learn more about sounds and how we articulate the sounds. And people have to have a long-term goal because I find that when people have short-term, are too are thinking too short-term and they put too much pressure on themselves, they just give up. And anything related to the languages requires patience. So... I always say to my students, just do a bit every day. Don't push yourself really hard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Long term, over the months and the years, you're definitely going to see results. But if you get into this thinking, I want results, I'm going to pay for some lessons and a course and I want results within two or three months. Yeah, you might get some results, but also you're just going to, you might feel a bit overwhelmed and you're going to lack the yeah. motivation to continue. Mm. 
so I would just say, I mean, I, I put in a lot of, I really, I mean, I, I, I want to help people. I really do. And I love getting the feedback. And if more people can know about my courses, the better, we can make uh, it better. but then again, it, the better, but again, I'm not about just selling it to everyone and anyone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's really meant for a specific kind of person. Yeah. I think it's for a certain kind of person. What am I trying to say? I'm trying mm -hmm. to say. <laughs> if this is, it sounds like if this is right for you, this is awesome because it's at the end of the day, it's all about, I think, us connecting and finding yeah. people who want to work with us, whichever yeah. one of us that is. And, and for us to bring it back to the beginning, I think collaborating is one of the best things out there so that people can get to know what we do a little bit better. They can yeah. see what it's really about. It's not just about pronunciation and it should be enjoyable. It should be fun. And I think that's what we both try to make it. We try to make it fun. We try to make it fresh. We keep it memorable and, and long lasting, I think, in the way as exactly. if somebody does yeah. want to do this. Yeah, it's one of the best things. And that's why I really love talking to you. It's been such a long time. I've had a great wow. time talking to you yeah. today. And let's maybe plan another podcast episode where we talk more about our experiences, maybe living abroad as living there and speaking that language, like you in Japan, maybe me in France, maybe. Definitely. Let's have experiences in France as well. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, plan another podcast episode coming up. Very soon. different to Japan. But yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed awesome. today. Yeah. Yeah. Let's definitely arrange another meeting. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So in the meantime, we'll say bye for now and we'll say see you soon, hopefully on maybe social media, maybe here again soon, probably not on Clubhouse because we're not there anymore. Yeah. But people can find us also, as you said, just on the web. So awesome. Awesome to talk to you again today, Anton, and I'll see you soon. Okay. See you soon. Take care, Bianca. You too. If you found this episode helpful in any way, please subscribe and leave a review. It's actually really helpful to me. Now, before I go, I have two tasks for you to do. First, I want you to register and come to my free monthly masterclass. They're on the last Thursday of the month. In just one hour, you're going to master a specific American accent skill. For example, the TH sound or rhythm. The Zoom registration link actually changes each month. So the second and maybe more important thing I want to ask you to do is to sign up for my mailing list because you're going to get the registration link each month and you're going to get bonus materials before and after the masterclass that I only send to my email list subscribers. The email opt-in link is down in the show notes. Be sure to sign up for my mailing list and come to the monthly masterclass for free. I'm Bianca, your personal American accent coach, and I want you to know that your voice is your choice. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the show. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye for now.